everyone. Welcome to another virtual edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. This is the first taping we have made since the death of George Floyd and the subsequent aftermath. It has been a wild, volatile week in the Twin Cities area. And when incidents like this happen, as we've seen over the last few years, people in sports, athletes, coaches, and many others don't hide their thoughts, their feelings. They don't stick to sports. As the old saying used to go, we all connected through sports, but we don't live in a vacuum. And Tamiya Yugas, who finished up her junior year at Roseville and will hopefully get to play again this next season. I know you have been witnessing what's going on and I thank you for joining us. Tamiya, I know we come on to talk about sports, but what have you made over the last few days about what's going on? Well, yeah, I think it's devastating and it doesn't feel real that it's happening, you know, to our next door neighbor. And it really sucks that it's taken three people's lives to really get the the man in jail. And it sucks, to be honest, because this has been an ongoing thing for many years, even way before we were all born. So I hope justice is served and peace is coming soon because this is very hectic. And then as we've seen, the protests have turned into riots and what started as a message of symbolism against, excuse me, I'm having a tough time to put this into words because I'm, I'm feeling all sorts of ways about this, against unjust behavior on people of color has turned into a highly volatile and dangerous situation as we have seen in the Lake Street area, in the Midway area of St. Paul a couple of days ago and the surrounding suburbs. This is an unprecedented time for all of us. And to me, uh, you've witnessed the evolution of this messaging, the Black Lives Matter movements that picked up steam four years ago when the Lynx chose to take a stand for Philando Castile. We're seeing it play out again. Over time, how has your role evolved as far as speaking out against atrocities like this? Well, I think it, as a person of color, it's kind of hard to. You're kind of scared to. I mean, I mean, it's been it's been rough, but I think that a lot of this, a lot of the writing is, I don't know. I guess it's people's way of speaking out against what's going on. But I also think there's a lot of people who don't care for George, George Floyd's death and are taking advantage of this situation to get things that, I mean, they want to steal. And I'm not saying all people are doing that. I'm saying some, including people out of our state, I guess people just want to make it seem as people of color are crazy, hectic, psychotic, and damaging, just craziness and all that. But I, I deeply believe people are taking advantage of the situation. And to expand on what to me, it was just saying, intelligence reports coming in over the last 24 hours have suggested that the rioting is being caused from people outside the state not associated with the protest movements. I remember yesterday PJ Hill, who I've gotten to know over the years uh, through covering the Hill family, he and Royce White and Daryl Thompson, the former uh, professional football player, organized a gathering at the Hennepin Avenue Bridge and as we saw, they were respectful. It's not the people in our community that are causing these problems. I got a sense of that last night when I saw some of the businesses that were on fire. And I know I'm feeling all sorts of emotions about this. I imagine you are too, because it's important for us to stand up when wrongdoing occurs. And at the same time, you look at what's happening and you've seen the response, how people come together to clean up. So what we have seen is not us. No, yeah, it isn't. So when you first got word about this, I believe it was on Monday and how this has become the dominant story of the week. What kind of feelings did you experience? Um, I felt fear. I have a brother who's a teenager and my fear is that happening to him. 
the man was innocent and his life was taken from another human being, which no human has the right to take another life. And I feel as if this could happen to anyone we love. And I mean, I'm heartbroken about the situation. Very heartbroken, yeah. If you want to, I'll leave this up to you. But over the time that you've grown up, when you started at Highland Park, came over to Roseville as a student, as an athlete, and just as a human being, were there any moments you dealt with involving racism, prejudice that symbolize some of the obstacles that we're still dealing with? Yeah, I mean, I didn't go through things that others have gone through. Mine wasn't as hurtful or harsh, but yeah. I mean, sometimes I would walk into the store and I would be seen and I'd be accused of stealing, but like at school, it's very hard to, my school is very diverse, but you see all sorts of groups. I mean, I used to hang out with all people that didn't truly understand where I was coming from, coming from the city to school with people who are, who have more money than me. And it was really tough at first, but I mean, I got through it. You mentioned having a teenage brother and Every time we go through this, I read stories from my friends, from my social media network on the experiences they go through having a family member or themselves not knowing if and when they would be perceived as a threat. And so for you, how do you handle that? I know you continue, as you said, you go to a diverse school in Roseville and a lot of people have accepted you over the years and at the same time, you're constantly having to deal with this backdrop. Yeah. Um, I mean, at a young age, this wasn't as common or, I mean, not a lot of people knew about it because we were just kids. And I think my brothers, we've never had the father figure to tell my brother that, I mean, when you're out on the street, you gotta be careful. So I try to tell my brother that all the time and tell him, sorry. I try to tell my brother that consistently that, I mean, be careful, don't do dumb things. And hopefully he learns from what's going on right now and is more knowledgeable after this. And at the same time, I have to imagine you have some concerns of your own. You know, being a teenager in the Twin Cities area, you're 6'2", 6'3", so you have a tall presence on the basketball court and away from it, I'm wondering, do you ever fear that such a situation could happen to you? Um, sometimes, but not really. I fear for my brother more because you don't, you hear about stories of females and the cops and police brutality with females, but it's not as common. So yeah, I'm scared, but I'm not scared to the depth that I would be for my brother. Over time, how would you say your role as an advocate for equal treatments and ensuring that people of color don't end up on the receiving end of unfair practices, treatments, behaviors, how would you say your voice has grown, your role as an advocate to ensure that what happened to George Floyd doesn't happen to someone else? Um, that's, a that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I try to use my voice in my community as much as possible. I mean, it's really hard though, as a female mainly, but there's a lot of people of color where I live and a lot of them are fearful for their children. And I believe that just having gatherings and speaking up about it, I mean, that helps. And so what are some of the difficulties, as you said, with being a female voice in this discussion? I mean, you're definitely sometimes not taken seriously. You're, sometimes people say, oh, you're a female, you don't get it. I mean, I don't get where you're going through. I, I will never be a man, but I do understand some sort of perspective. And I think that, yeah, I think that's it, yeah. That is a real interesting point because this week, I know I've reached out to a lot of my friends of color, and I understand I'll never have to play this twisted game of Russian roulette, because in order for anyone to see me as a threat, I'd have to do something pretty blatant, and I know not all of my friends have that shield. 
and to hear what you're saying is real interesting because we've seen a lot of women of color speak out when things like this happen and yet you still have to deal with people who don't take you seriously because you're a woman and to me that is just bizarre yeah i don't get it i mean it's been like this for hundreds of years and it's not changing anytime soon it's a man's world well i know you're doing your part to change that in the athletic field and elsewhere and i know we have a lot to talk about with your backstory but as this continues well, we could be in for a volatile weekend as far as riots go, but this discussion will not end. You know, there will be a time when we get past this and we can go back to grieving for George Floyd, demanding changes in our justice system and beyond. So what can we do to help move the conversation forward? As in we, do you mean like? We, we, because you, know, you can speak from experience with your family, yourself, uh, you have a perspective I won't. And for those of us who may not be able to relate to you simply because we don't have to worry about our safety at any day of the week, any time, what are some tips? What would be some guidance that you would offer to us? What can we do to help move this conversation forward? Yeah, definitely use your voice. Speak up. I mean, your voice needs to be heard, your opinion matters, and I believe if you speak up, lots of other people will retweet or screenshot what you said and pass it on to others, and others will do the same, and then your voice will be heard throughout lots of other places. So I think it's very important for you to speak up on your mind. Yeah. And something that I've seen, and this is just based on my social media network, is the shift in discussion, because even as, recently as four years ago with Philando Castile, you still had folks not quite understand why people such as yourself are speaking out against something that's wrong, or they come up with explanations to mitigate the impact. We're not seeing that line of discussion play out as much. We're seeing a lot of folks understand that what happened was not okay and even though we have a long way to go in this battle, in this struggle, what do you think that says about the progress we're making where we're not getting the level of pushback that we did for Jamar Clark and Philando Castile? I mean, first thing though, we did the right thing. We got the officer to become arrested. Yes, I don't agree with third degree murder. I think he deserves second degree, but I, that's the justice system for us. That's that's what they see, and that's what, I mean, there's clearly evidence in front of them. There's a brutal video that's out there. So you see the evidence there. And I mean, five years ago, Philando Castile's murderer was set free. The years 2012, uh, Trayvon Martin, he was set free. So I guess this is a step in the right direction, and I believe, hopefully, others will be arrested and charged with some sort of like something and I mean we're going in the right direction right now hopefully and a common refrain I hear from a lot of my friends colleagues contacts of color is the sense that they're tired and they have every right to be if you ask me so for you when you see what happens I imagine you go through a wide array of emotions and <laughs> it can be real difficult to handle. So over the years, when you see something like this happen, when you hear about another black man or another person of color killed when they didn't need to be, how do you cope with those emotions? Because I imagine you hear, you mentioned going back to Trayvon Martin. So you've had to deal with this roller coaster for many, many years. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel the emotions of the families that go through it or the people closest to them that go through it, but I definitely feel sad. It's, it's really sad that this is happening currently. I mean, it's, it's happening consistently on a day-to-day -day basis. And we didn't have telephones 50 years ago, so it was probably happening more often. Now we have people to be exposed. So I think it's really tough for people to see that. I mean, when you have to go outside and you're scared for your life because you see another man who look like you, who dress like you, who talk like you, gunned down and killed, obviously you're gonna be scared and you're gonna think, could that be me next? As I noted at the start, 
you and I, we connected through sports and we have a mutual friend in the Priolo Buford family. Yeah. But we don't live in vacuums. When life happens, we feel the same emotions as everyone else. And you've seen prominent athletes and coaches speak up. And I'm seeing that now, even among fellow high school uh, players. You know, I had Adalia McKenzie on this just a few days before all of this went down. And you know, she's speaking out about it. Of course, PJ Hills is one of her trainers. So we're all connected to what is going on around us. And as athletes, I know you're still at the high school level, soon to be at the college level. What has this taught you about you know, living history, about civics, about knowing when to speak out, knowing that you're part of this community that isn't afraid to say something when we go through transgressions like this? Yeah, um, it's definitely difficult. I mean, you don't know if you speak out, can you get in trouble for it? I mean, yeah, we have the freedom of speech, but there's people who always hate on what we have to say, and especially our opinions. And I think people are starting to realize if you don't speak out, this will keep on happening, even if you do speak out. But the more, pe the more that people speak out, the bigger the protest, that will help out a lot. So I think that's what people are starting to figure out. And I, I mean, we've known that for years, hundreds of years. So, I mean, there's no change to it, but hopefully things start to change and progress. And years ago, the attitude was stick to sports. We don't see that anymore. And whether or not you end up pro or a Wade Trophy winner, I'm not going to make that proclamation because I'm not a scout. What do you think has led students like yourself to say to heck with this, we can't sit on the sidelines? I think that we've been seeing this since we were kids happening over and over. And we all realize that we, we, we have a voice and our voice should be heard. And I think people are tired of seeing this on the news all the time. Like, wow, another person was killed by a cop. Wow, another person of color was killed. And so I think that a lot of us, a lot of our like athletes like me are just like, we'll use our voice for the right reason and to speak up on this because if we don't, then things won't change. So I think that's what we're doing. And I think it's an amazing thing. Now you mentioned earlier, not having a father figure growing up, but when you made your announcement that you were going to LSU, you've mentioned how much the Priolos have invested in you as a human, as a student, as an athlete. I've gotten to know them. Uh, Dijonay and I are pen pals, and I understand she used to coach you way back when. And they are among the voices speaking out about what happened to George Floyd as well. And if you follow Diaz, to me and I have, she's very outspoken about making sure her community is safe. How do you think their role, well, especially with D, who coached you on the Sugar teams, if I remember correctly, and has been with you, goes to all your games, how has she helped shape you as an athlete and as an advocate? Yeah, so I've known them for about five, six years almost, and she's definitely a big sister that I look up to. She's gone through so much, and I, I look at that, and I learn from what she's gone through. And I think the Prelos and the, the like, they're all, their community, like, they're leaders of their community, and they know that their voice is just as important as others. So I think they're advocating for their community and stepping up, which is right for me to And I understand the two of you talk frequently, even though a D doesn't coach you anymore. And have the two of you had any conversations about this week or in the past? And if not, that's fine too. But I mean, we've what, all, what kind, yeah. Yeah, we've all talked a little bit about it. We spoke our opinions about it, but I mean, not too much about it. I think we're just listening to the news and seeing what's going on. And we're just, we're just waiting for some, you know, information just as this everyone is. So that's what we're doing. Right now. And that's a good point. As one of my friends told me, a lot of folks are still raw. You know, they're seeing what's happening. We're all worried about what the Twin Cities could look like in the next few days. But 
many of them still aren't afraid to have their voices heard. And that was one reason, you know, I, when I talked to you and I've talked to others, why I'm offering this talk show that we usually reserve for athletes and other sports figures to share old histories, a chance to speak their mind because this is an ongoing conversation. And I remember when this happened on Monday and I saw it was George Floyd and I haven't seen the video. I don't care to, uh, because I was already dealing with enough emotional turbulence in my head. I'm going, we got to go through this again when one time was too many. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely devastating, especially that I'm pretty sure you're the daughter and I mean, growing up with a father figure is tough enough, but knowing that you, you could have had your father if someone, if that one person had just taken their, their knee off. So I think she'll probably think about it. I mean, a lot of people are thinking, what if, what if? This could have been prevented. There were about four cops. So I think there's definitely wonders about, could this man still be alive? Can our city be changed? I mean, our city is changing completely right now. And like you said, we don't know how it will look three days from now. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. So I think that's a scary thing though, also. Definitely uncertain times at a level we haven't experienced before. You know, certainly not when Jamar Clark or Philando Castile were killed. And I don't know what the best way is to move the conversation forward, but I think that's why I asked you, what can we do? Because so it's quite clear that in order for this to work, in order for us to have structural change, we can't sit on the sidelines anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah, I mean, everyone's voice is just as important as the other. A non-person like color's voice is just as important. But if you don't have anything to say that is positive, or if you can't, if you don't support, then just don't say it at all. I don't think we need to hear any more negative comments, especially from people that we wouldn't expect it from. So I think if it's negative, keep it to yourself. If it's supporting, say it because your voice is just as important. And that's why we wanted to feature your voice in our series, one of many reasons. And we have to remember to me, this is happening amidst the backdrop of a pandemic. You had to finish the school year online. We have no idea if we'll have a season next year. And I have to imagine there will be repercussions about what's going on because coronavirus is still out there. And so when this does subside, who knows what that's going to look like. I mean, we're looking for the positive in the coronavirus. I mean, pandemic. And it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like the coronavirus is still going on. I mean, we're so focused on the protesting. And I think, I mean, the protesting, people are being safe. They have masks. They're staying apart. But, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Well, the reason I brought up the COVID-19 pandemic is because, you know, you have a lot to celebrate. You mentioned you're going to Louisiana State, LSU, uh, the school that made Simone Augustus and Sylvia Fowles and Tamika Johnson uh, way back when. And you had a solid junior season. You have a state tournament run on your resume. And you know, now you're dealing with all this uncertainty on you know whether or not we'll have games or if we'll be able to get together. And I know for you, as you said right now, that's taking a back seat, but just – what do you make of the volatility on that front where you have no idea when your athletic career can resume? Yeah, I mean, it's really sad. I mean, it hurts and there are bigger problems right now. I get that. But this was our last season of AAU and it's going to be my senior year. So it'll definitely suck if we can't, if we're prevented to play the game we all love with my, my teammates that I truly like, I miss everyone, and it's really tough to think about what if, what if this could have been different, what if we stopped it earlier, and yeah, right after we lost against Centennial back in March, I was like, yeah, I'm looking towards AU, I'm looking forward for it, I mean, this is an opportunity to showcase what, I, what, I, what I've learned and how much I've grown, so yeah, it was really heartbreaking to learn that we couldn't play, but I mean, it's looking, uh, it's looking good on the bright side, starting June 1st, so. We certainly hope 
although as we said, this could change in a hurry once the dust settles and we continue our battle with coronavirus. And if that wasn't enough, you're dealing with a coaching change too. You know, Jeff Crosby, who's been with you the last three years, decided to step down. I don't think Roseville has announced a replacement yet. So that's another element of change you have to deal with. And I don't know, again, if you'll have a chance to work with the new coach, but when you found out that Crosby was stepping down, uh, how did you take the news? It was definitely sad. I mean, Crosby's done a lot for me the past three years, and I'll, I'll always appreciate what he's done. He's helped me become a better player, but also a better person. So I truly appreciate everything he's done for me and Roseville and the team. I mean, there's a lot of history with him being here for almost 11 years, I think. And so I hope to carry that history on. And I'm excited for the new coaching staff, and I appreciate the old one. They did a lot for us, but I'm excited for this new opportunity to get to know new coaches, new style. And I think it's a, it's a good step in the right direction, hopefully, and we all learn from them. Yeah. And a member of his staff the last couple of years is somebody who is supposed to be playing for the Minnesota Lynx right now, and Rachel Bannum. And I know that made news when she was hired. Uh, and I remember talking to her. She had a contact that helped get her on the staff. So what has that been like, having a professional athlete on the bench, giving you guidance, instruction, feedback, and support uh, these last couple of years with the Roseville Raiders? I mean, when I found out Rachel was coming to coach for us, it was incredible. I think it was an amazing opportunity to learn from someone as great as her, who I had great four years at the U, and I think all the knowledge I've learned and that I've stored in my mind will help me through college, through this next season. And she was an amazing and a huge impact on our team. We became really close with her. I've definitely missed her because she obviously, she had a big impact on our team. She was one of us. And so, I mean, the Lynx are lucky to have her, definitely. You've gotten a chance to work with plenty of history with Crosby there for over a decade, Rachel Bannum, turning from a you know, solid prospect at Lakeville North to the all-time leading score for the Golden Gophers to WNBA. If you don't mind sharing, when did your history with basketball begin? When did you get that first itch to play? So, I mean, I grew up playing, but I didn't really play. I just played in the backyard, but I really started in sixth grade. I mean, I played middle school ball my first year, and and then, no, I'm sorry, I played with Coach Laureen Steve. They took a chance on me, and through that, it progressed to playing high school ball. They prepared me for that, and Coach Deb took a chance on a little seventh grader who didn't know much about the game, and I was still learning about the sport I truly began to love. So, I mean, sixth grade, I played with – Coach Lauren Steve, seventh and eighth, I played at Highland, which were an amazing opportunity. And who knows, we could have built something great, but I moved on to Roseville and the history throughout that. I mean, yeah. And I know you're one of several athletes who started at Highland and then moved elsewhere. And so what led you to make the jump from Highland Park to Roseville from your eighth to ninth grade year? I had a former teammates parents suggest at school and we looked into it I was interested it did hurt to leave Highland but I saw I saw a chance so I took it and it's I mean it's been good so far well it's hard to argue against that from what I've seen what was that adjustment like as you go from playing at Highland Park you know the St. Paul City Conference then you go to Roseville the Suburban East you're in a 4A school so you're dealing with a higher level competition than you were at Highland Park, and you've thrived within Roseville system, as we've seen, uh, but I imagine there still was a period where you had to adapt to the new surroundings. Yeah, I mean, my freshman year was absolutely hard. It was really hard to, like, I mean, I was very stressed, frustrated. Going from a 3A school to a 4A school isn't that easy, and I had to fight for my spot. I didn't know whether I was playing JV or varsity, but I mean, it all ended up turning out good, but it was definitely, the competition was amazing. I had I'd played with the best players in the conference. I competed with them. I practiced against them. So it definitely helped me become a better player. And I was grateful for the opportunity. And of course you play more than one sport at Roseville. I've seen you on the volleyball team and do you have a spring sport as well? 
I played track my I was on the field team. I did throwing my freshman year, but I didn't it didn't turn out as I thought it would, so I had to move on. <laughs> well, the basketball route seemed to be working for you. Uh, yeah. but that being said, what kind of joy or fun, what's what is it like to have a another sport to get involved and not have to worry about how it's going to look for college coaches, things like that. You know, you're on the volleyball team and I know you're not going to play at the collegiate level in that sport, but what are some things you've picked up anyway? I mean, definitely. I'm a competitive person and I saw that as an opportunity to could do something and I got to know a lot of amazing people that I wouldn't have known if I didn't take that chance and play volleyball and my my teacher my freshman year coach you and he was like we're gonna make you play volleyball and I was like I didn't really want to I thought it was a stupid sport no offense to those but I grew to love the game and it's definitely given me a lot of opportunities and maybe I'm better and a better athlete a better basketball player so I'm forever grateful for that I was gonna say I'm guessing if someone were to come up or if someone asked you, what do you think of volleyball now? You wouldn't call it a stupid sport. No, I'd say <laughs> the love of my lives. <laughs> Especially if you go to Gophers games. I know I went to many as a college student and I really started to get into that sport more too. And yeah. we've talked about the pre lows Well, I guess Buford, uh, Dee's been married for the last few years and uh, has two, two kids who I'm sure will be, uh, five-star recruits in about 10 years. We're going to be hearing about them, right? Yeah, definitely. DJ and Jordan, amazing. They're like my little siblings. I'm pretty sure everyone from AU knows who they are. They all love them. So, yeah, I mean, they all play multiple sports. They both do. And they're amazing at them. So I can't wait to see how they develop into great athletes. Well, my favorite is when uh, Tehran, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'll see him officiate games. And that's how we met. And his son would like to dress up as him. So I'd see him in the little <laughs> official's uniform. And I think I mentioned that once in a game that I was calling. It was a section game and they got a kick out of it. But that's pretty cool. And I know he got his first D1 gig this past season. And then yeah. he's got his son who <laughs> wants to be like his dad. Yeah, DJ is hilarious. Yeah, I mean, Teron's an amazing ref too. So, I mean, he's definitely deserved going D1. He worked hard for it. I imagine he doesn't officiate any of your games. Um, no, no, I'm not. Gonna say, and I think just because of the connection, that'd probably be real awkward anyway. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, my meme mug and sad will come out, and I'll accidentally probably yell at him, but he'll give me a team, throw me at the game too. So. <laughs> okay, so he's made it clear he's not going to go easy on you if that were to happen, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when you first met D? Because I know you were involved with their sugar program. Do you remember that what that first meeting was like and how has that friendship grown over the years? Yeah, shout out to Sugar. But yeah, no, yeah. Um this was a while back, so I have to think about it. Yeah, I went to their practice and I was just a kid who played on the street. I played street ball, so I didn't really know much. I didn't know travels really I didn't know out of bounds I mean learning plays was difficult for me because I didn't understand that at that age but they they helped me develop and I think the first part I, I'm, I was a very shy kid and I mean I still am but it was just incredible to learn different people I mean people I would have never met and so it was a great opportunity for me and they took a chance on me they didn't they already had a full team but I mean I'm forever thankful for that chance and they've grown to be my second family. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And what would you make of their outreach where they've added you into their family in a way that reminds me of the line from Mr. Feeney, Boy Meets World, you don't have to be blood to be family. And when did you, uh, what do, you do you recall when they offered to add you into their ranks? Yeah, I mean, from the first day, I was a part of their family when I first stepped on that court, but it progressed. I think, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure eighth grade is when, I mean, they took me to AU practice. They got me involved in that. And I mean, they were there every day. They took me to practice. They fed me. So I think it really started in sixth, seventh grade. And 
now start like back in eighth grade, ninth grade, I go to Christmas, even though I don't celebrate it. They invite me. I go to Thanksgiving. I mean, I was there for DJ and Jordan's birthday party each year. So I've been there a lot and I really appreciate them letting me in since, I mean, my family supports my athletics, but I mean, it's a different environment with them. I find it amusing. You don't celebrate Christmas and they said, ah, come on over, celebrate with us anyway. That's got to be cool for you. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, I never knew what Christmas was about. I've never been a part of that. And so, I mean, I had amazing grits from Coach Steve, had a great breakfast, and I understood the definition of family when I first became, when I went with them. So I think it was amazing for me to just feel the love. Any moments or stories, interactions that you can recall that symbolize that friendship, that connection you've had with the Bufords? Yeah, I mean, when we were practicing, I went, when Coach Steve and Lori had a team and they were practicing, they invited me to come and just work out with them. And DJ was there and we were just taking Snapchat photos. And I guess that's where the bond really built from there. We became closer and closer and he was like a little brother to me. And I mean, they've all looked out for me. And it's been, it was really, it's amazing. And on the point about celebrating Christmas, if I'm correct, you are a Muslim? Yeah. And the reason I ask is, it goes back to Enes Cantor, I believe, who plays for Portland. And you may recall how he chose to observe Ramadan in the midst of an NBA playoff run. And I know that Ramadan is one of the most celebrated customs in Muslim culture. So for you as an athlete, when you have to enter that period, how do you observe it? And how do you train yourself with the amount of work you put in as an athlete? How do you train yourself to make sure that you're not affected by it, if you know what I mean, athletically speaking? Yeah, I get it. I mean, it is super hard. And a lot of my teammates wanted to understand it. And my coach, Coach Josh, wanted to understand it. So, I mean, they tried it with me. I mean, some couldn't survive it, but yeah. It's definitely hard the first week. Your body's adjusting to not having water or food for the day, but you definitely, starting in the morning before sunrise, you eat something small and healthy, like a fruit, a smoothie, or a porridge, or oatmeal, you know, something like that. And when you break it, you want to make sure you don't eat so much that you're bloated. In our religion, it's not right to get full, so you're trying to eat a little bit, save it. I mean, you try to drink as much as water as you can, but it's really hard to work out through the day, but I mean, you try to, especially since it gets hotter and hotter each day. Well, especially when the Ramadan cycle falls in the spring summer months, which is your AAU season. And so you mentioned how difficult it is the first week. How taxing is it, especially in AAU season? I know you don't have to worry about it this year, but you know, the last couple of years you're playing two, three games a day, perhaps. And You've got to ride it out until sunset. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I had the mentality, I can't do it anymore. I can't. I need water. And sometimes, yeah, I will break my fast, which wasn't right. But at the end of the day, I learned a lot. And sometimes I would – so we would have practice at night, which helped a lot because it was close to breaking, about two hours before breaking or an hour. And I felt like hell. I felt like I was dying. So I could not imagine NBA athletes or just football players doing it. So it was really hard for me, but I learned a lot from it. And I would be completely understanding if you or others decided I'm going to wait until it's easier. But, you know, for you, it sounds like I'm going to st ride through it, stick it out. Yeah. I mean, you see your teammates drinking water and you're just like, that looks really good. It looked really good. And I think, I mean, especially since we were in hot gyms sometimes, and I couldn't even use my inhaler. So, I mean, that's how hard it was. And I mean, it was a rough period, but you realize that you're not doing it for yourself, but for your belief. And that's when you really learn to push. So I think it was a really great experience for me to learn. And just, just it was just, you acknowledge people that don't go you know, have food or water for a whole day. So, I mean, it, it was amazing. It was a good learning experience. Well, and you'll continue to learn through that experience uh, because you, know, you may get older and your athletic career may come to an end, but 
you know, Ramadan doesn't, much like Christmas and all these other observances. And you touched on this before, making sure you don't get bloated beforehand. How have you trained yourself over the years to help you get through periods where you can't eat or drink until sundown? So during the year, you could choose to fast. There's three days that they have. I think it's Monday, Thursday, and Friday. And that's when you would teach yourself throughout the year, okay, I'm going to eat small. And before Ramadan comes, you're going to teach yourself, let me eat small, like, let me at least eat twice a day, but where it's a small portion. And I mean, no matter if you train or not, it's going to be hard for you because you're adjusting to something hard. And I mean, no amount of practice will teach you the, the stuff that you need. But I mean, when you eat small, your body will adjust to that. So, I mean, sorry, your, your, your body will develop and it'll change and it'll help it and you mentioned the most difficult phase of the first week i'm guessing over time you become more used to it mm -hmm. yeah after the first and second week it didn't even feel like i needed food or water and you realize how much i mean before that you would eat just because you wanted to eat and i think that was a great lesson for me and after ramadan ended my my diet completely changed I don't eat the way I used to, or I don't eat the foods that I used to eat. And I mean, it was an important lesson for me to learn that you only eat really when you really need to. I mean, your mind may say you're hungry, but you're really not. It's when your stomach tells you you're hungry. When Eid Mubarak comes around, how do you make sure you don't cheat? Because you know, you're still going out there, you're still getting buckets. Yeah, I mean, it's a celebration, but I mean, at the end of the day, you have to make sure what you eat won't affect you when you get up in the morning. I mean, a lot of athletes, that they eat what they want, and that's what I used to do, but I realized that the day after was very crucial. I felt very sick sometimes. So I taught myself, eat, but don't eat too much or don't eat too late in the night. Have what you want, but make sure it's not a lot, like a large portion. And it helped me out this Eid, and Eid this year was amazing last week, so I think it was fun. Well, speaking of eating, what are some of your favorite foods? Oh, I definitely love my, my injera. It's Ethiopian food and my malawah, my Somali food. But if I'd say American, I'd definitely say I like a good steak and rice or some pasta. And for those of us who may not be aware, can you mention uh, Ethiopian Somalian foods? So I even forget yeah. what the pronunciations, but uh, what are those dishes for those of us who may not be in the know? Yeah, so my mom and her side's from Somalia. We have, it's called crepes in French, I think, but we call them malalah. They seem similar, but they're really not. So, I mean, you can have that with a glass of tea or you can eat it by itself. And it's kind of sweet, so it tastes good. And jera is, it's like a big loaf of flat bread. And you have it with spicy meat and sauce, and that's Ethiopian. And then Kenyan, we have like, it's like a ball of rice, but it's not rice. It's called ugali and sugo. So I think it's really good. I mean, it's not the healthiest choice of food, but I mean, it tastes really good and it's worth it. I think you can find that no matter uh, which country you experience as far as food tastes go. And then what is your go-to pre-game, post-game snack? Post, okay. Pre-game, I like to get me, my meal is, I have Chipotle, but I don't have what I usually get. But after, I like to just have me like a milkshake or like sometimes I have to eat a salad, but not really. Or I just go to sleep because I'm not hungry. You don't have what you usually get at Chipotle. I don't even know what you usually get. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, my Chipotle, when I'm not having a game, is just hot sauce and sour cream and cheese and rice but and white rice. But I get like brown rice, sour cream, barbacoa, like more healthier options that won't affect me before I play. So I don't need to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't need to use the bathroom because uh, the last thing we need is you're at the free throw line. It's a tie game you, or you got to hit two to take the lead. And yeah. all of a sudden you find yourself, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. That it's happened to me before and it wasn't easy and it wasn't fun. It was really embarrassing. So I try to prevent that as much as possible. So does that happen to you in a game? When I was younger, yeah. Okay, I'm going to say, I don't remember you ducking out at a high school game when I've seen you play. No, yeah, I try to prevent that. And 
on the subject of Ramadan and Eid, for those who aren't familiar with Muslim culture, what is the significance of Ramadan? Why do you practice it? And what does it help teach you? Yeah, Ramadan, we fast for 30 days and no food in the water, as you know, but it's more of a spiritual thing. You get closer to God, you learn more about your religion. And there's a thing called the last 10 nights, there's a thing called Light al Al-Qubar. And that helps you, it's, it says one of those nights, God will have a night and he'll have where you can make prayer to him and he'll forgive you for everything. It just depends on what you ask for. So I think it's really thing is where you really get close to God, you learn more about yourself and Eid is a celebration for the people who fasted. I mean, you can't celebrate it when you didn't fast, but I mean, that'll just be you. But fasting, I mean, it's really nice to go from not eating and having to eat at nighttime to just enjoying your day with food. It doesn't feel real until the morning up. So, I mean, it's exciting. And on the subject of having to go to the bathroom in the middle of a game, what would you say has been the most exciting moment of your playing career and what was the most embarrassing moment? Um, there's a lot of exciting moments between state, but I definitely say traveling with my AU teammates was amazing. Um, we played, we had this weekend period. It was my birthday. It was like the July 22nd through 25th tournament last year. And we beat teams that no one thought we could beat. And so I think that was the greatest experience I've ever had. I mean, we were, Undoubt, like we were doubted and it felt good to beat those teams and prove people wrong so I think that's one of my memorable experiences yeah an embarrassing moment I'd have to say um I don't want to say it but it's okay one time we were playing park center my freshman year and a girl knocked me and I felt really hurt on the ground and that moment I knew uh, I knew I had to use the bathroom. I got knocked so hard. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. If you don't mind, how cool was it to reach the state semis your freshman year, your first year at Roseville? You're not sure what to make of it. You spoke earlier about trying to earn a spot on the varsity team after making this jump from Highland Park. And as an unseated team, you were able to knock off a conference rival in Creighton Durham Hall and make it the farthest that Roseville has gone in a long time for girls basketball. Yeah, I mean, during the state tournament, I was really, really sick. I mean, I tried to play, but I wasn't feeling the greatest. And so at that moment, I was just thinking, I wasn't thinking about the opportunity I had in front of me. I was just thinking, I need to get better. And so when I look back on it, I'm wishing, I, yeah, I wish, I'm glad we went to state my freshman year, but if it was this year, I think it would have been amazing because I'm more mature and I know what I'm putting myself in. So I think it was really exciting for me, but I didn't realize how, how, how hard of a chance it is to get to state and not a lot of people get to experience it through their four years. So yeah, I'm grateful for that experience. And throughout this week, I had a chance to talk with D and while the two of you were working together for the sugar team, some things she told me is that you're highly coachable and that you often give a thumbs up after receiving instruction. At least that was one of your habits from an early age. Yeah. When I was younger, I didn't like to speak that much. And so I just be like, yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but yeah, no, I, uh, I'm not very picky when it comes to coaching. I listen, I do my part. And I don't believe in talking back or saying stuff in your breath, really. So I stay positive and I try to be a role model. And I know that there's people looking. And so I try to keep myself composed through every situation. I wonder if that goes into another habit she told me about where after a bad play or a foul, you would uh, walk off and talk to your hand, apparently. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I'd be like, why are my hands disappointing me? I'd blame it on my hands. <laughs> So you don't talk back, you just talk to the hand. Yeah, I talk to the hand. I blame it on the hand. Maybe you're the one who started that phrase all those years ago and you just didn't know it. <laughs> Probably, yeah. How much more vocal have you become where you went from this shy kid, you know, wants to play well, but you know, doesn't want to make a bad impression. 
how have you developed your communication over the years? Yeah, no, yeah. If you talked to me freshman year, I definitely would have been more closed off, but I've learned that your, my opinion matters no matter your freshman, sophomore, junior, eighth grader, senior. And so I really, I was like, yeah, I'm going to say what I need to say. And if you don't listen, that's on you. And so I started to speak up a lot more. And I realized that, yeah, I was super uncomfortable, but to be able to be successful in life, you need to get out of your comfort zone. So I started to realize I need to get out of there. And now I'm captain. So it's like my leadership has grown and my vocality has grown. And that's helped me. And hopefully it it's better next year. It's not where it needs to be, but it'll be better. And not only has your vocabulary and your voice evolved over the years, I remember when you announced that you were going to play for LSU, a lot of us were surprised yeah. and not that, and not in the way that you didn't deserve that opportunity, but I know in the prep circuit, there wasn't a lot of chatter about you as far as where you might end up. So what led you to LSU and how many other offers, uh, were you considering at the time? There were a couple of schools that gave me good offers and interests and stuff, but LSU had everything I needed, mainly educational. Their education is amazing. They have a 100% graduation rate, and you have a tutor for each class, and I think that's really important for me because, I yes, I am going there for basketball, but I'm mainly going there for my education because you, you'll have your education for the rest of your life, but basketball will only last so long. And... I think they gave me an opportunity I couldn't buy. And it was it was amazing. And going there to learn the culture and it just it's completely different from Minnesota. It's down south. I get to try new things. I get to develop into a different person. And the coaching the coach told me that that's a family and that Sundays they would go over her house. And so I was like, that's what I want to be a part of and I want to help build it. And so she she helped me I mean, I'm there now, and I'm forever grateful for it, and I'm excited. What kind of response did you get when you made your announcement? I know everyone says, congrats, congrats, you know, and they want to support you, and you have a lot of supporters around here. And it took me a day or two just to absorb that. She's going to LSU and the SEC. I didn't see that coming. And so what kind of yeah. feedback did you get when you said you were going to be a part of the Go Tigers community? Yeah. I think a lot of the people were shocked, just as you said. I mean, no one really expected me, out of all people, to go, I mean, down south and play for that, that amazing school. But, yeah, I mean, it didn't feel real at first. And it was just like, wow. And a lot of people were like, congratulations, people haven't spoken to in many years. And I think it was just an exciting moment. You feel good. I mean, it felt great. I can't lie. It felt really great. And as I touched on earlier in this conversation, you're not going to a mid-major or just some seemingly random school. You know, LSU has produced a lot of athletes who found success in the pros with Simone Augustus and Sylvia Fowles. The two of them, of course, won a couple titles together for the Lynx. Tamika Johnson, who I believe uh, was Rookie of the Year in 05 and won a championship with Phoenix. So you're going to a program that comes up often in women's basketball discussions. What excites you about that? And what challenges do you think will come when you graduate from Roseville and switch the black and silver for purple and gold? Yeah, I mean, like everyone goes through, their freshman year will definitely be hard. The first two weeks will be a transition for, me, for you, especially since I'm going far. But I think it would be an amazing experience because I get to be a part of history. I get to be a part of that amazing program. And there's people that I've looked up to since I started playing that are that were a part of that program or still are today. And so I think it's amazing. And I'll get a lot of opportunities playing for Coach Nikki. And I think it will be amazing. And I'm very, very, very excited for it, especially to be meeting people. I, I dreamt of meeting when I was younger. And on that subject, who were your idols growing up in the sport of basketball? Men, women, any level? When yeah. you decided this was going to be a part of your life, your chapter in history, who did you look up to? I didn't look up to one person individually. I looked up to many players. I looked up to Kobe. I looked up to LeBron. I looked up to Steph Curry, Russell Westbrook, um, 
Kevin Garnett through his fierceness. I looked up to many players. Each, I've learned to pass from Rajon Rondo. I've learned to shoot from another player, Ray Allen. I mean, I, I, like, I, like, I, see, I see multiple players that have what I want. So I, I don't have one player that I really look up to. I look up to many. So, I mean, that's an odd thing. Everyone has that one player, but I look up to many, not just one. So you just want to be everybody, apparently. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> whoever, whoever you're feeling are in the moment, it sounds like that's who you want to be. On the women's side, is there anyone? Yeah, I look up to Candace Parker, Elena Deladon. Uh, I looked up to Tamika Ketching, Sylvia Fowles. Um, who else? Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird, Brianna Stewart. So there's a lot of people I look up to. And I grew up to watching a lot of them. And on that subject with all the players you listed, are we going to see you develop your three-point shot anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, there was a situation and I didn't get to shoot as much. But, yeah, I've always had a shot. I just never had the confidence really to. My confidence died down. But my last year, my junior year, I started to shoot more. And I definitely have the confidence that I will shoot three-pointers more and on a consistent basis, not just shoot them and miss them, but make them. And I was slightly teasing with that, only because when yeah. I watched you play, most of your work is down low, more of that Sylvia Fowles type player, you know, yeah. uh, work the paint, post up moves, things like that. And you do quite well down there. Uh, I guess having your six foot three frame helps, but how have you developed that skill over the years? Yeah, I mean, I had a good post game before I went to Roseville, but they really helped develop me into an aggressive player. I wasn't very aggressive. I was soft. I was weak. But I've learned to manage on my own, especially playing in the Suburban East Conference. It's really hard. You're going against challenging people. You're going against D1 high prospects. And it was really – I learned a lot. I learned to be physical. I learned that. It's you against another player. And if you let them beat you down, they'll do it every night, and they'll think it's easy. So I just had to really grow. and. I learned to be aggressive, which I'm very appreciative for now. And how true that is with Stillwater and what they've done the last couple of years, Creighton Durham Hall and Franny Hottinger. And there's a pretty good crop of athletes in that suburban East. Yeah. Yeah, definitely amazing athletes have come from the suburban East Conference. And it was an honor playing against them. So it was definitely exciting. I'm going to say you're part of that list now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be listed as one of them. And Roseville, you know, they're not a team that's going to outrun you like Hopkins or Stillwater want to do. That being said, you still made it as an honorable mention this year in the All-State category. That's the first time you've received that kind of recognition. Yeah. And – what did that symbolize for you about your growth and your dedication to the sport that, you know, you're on the list of you know, players to watch really, or players to keep an eye on at least for the underclassmen, but to get an honorable mention, I think because only 10 make it to all state, but you know, you're in that list uh, right under it for you that had to have meant something. Yeah. It meant a lot for me and it showed that, my work is paying off. My hard work ethic is paying off. And it, it feels good because, I mean, there's some people who work consistently on a day-to-day -day basis and they don't get anything. So I think it meant a lot for me. And, I mean, it was amazing. I, I appreciate it. And it was exciting for me to say, your work has paid off, but there's still more I need to do. Honorable mention is, it's, it's amazing, but I want to be on that top 10 list, hopefully. And I have the opportunity to, and I keep growing. So I think I can do it next year, and I, I plan to. Now, Roseville's style of play, you probably can't pull off at LSU because it's a shot clock in college basketball. But what has that taught you about patience? Yeah, definitely says it gives you a lot of time to read the defense. And you learn when you control the game, then – a lot of things will come your way. If you hold the other team's shot selections and shot counts down, they'll, they'll definitely probably have struggles. And, yeah, I mean, it was – it was. I mean, not a lot of people agreed with the way we played, but I definitely learned a lot, especially with defense and patience. And, I mean, I was always a patient player, but I got a lot more patient there. And whatever happens, you know, if this – 
past season ends up being your last. We hope it isn't, but you know, who knows what the future will hold at this point. What have you learned? What have you taken from your experience as a high school varsity player? I learned that every game is not given. You play every game like it's your last. I mean, I've seen players go down thinking they'll play the next day. And so, I mean, every opportunity I was given, I took advantage of it and it helped me grow to become who I am today. And I mean, if there's no season next year, I just know I ended off on a good note. Even though we didn't go to state, I was proud of the way the season went. And hopefully we keep it going and this thing dies down so I can have my senior season back. But yeah, I was excited about how the season ended. I think you speak for all of us on that point. I know I want to get back out there and call more games when I look at all the names in the 2021 class, yourself included. And it's like, oh, I hope we can play because I want to go and you know, give all these athletes a send off. And uh, what have you learned from your fellow teammates? And what do you think you've taught them over the last several years? Because I imagine not many, for example, have a teammate who identifies as Muslim as one example. And as you spoke of earlier, you know, your work in basketball has helped you become more comfortable with your voice. Yeah. I mean, they get to see what I go through on a daily basis sometimes and how sometimes life can be challenging. But yeah, I think for me, I'm not a very serious person unless I really have to be. So I'm teaching them that you don't have to be serious in every moment and situation. There's times where you can laugh, even during a game, before a game. I mean, it's fine with laughing, but you have to be able to change that mindset right away when you, when you, when tip off starts. So I think that was a, a lot of things that I taught them is be serious, but you'd be able to have fun. The game isn't just to, yeah, it's a game. So th there's no point in being serious the whole 40 minutes, have fun, smile, enjoy it because you don't know when you'll be able to play again, even though you think you'll play tomorrow. Now, I'm wondering, have you had any one-on-one -on -one or team battles with D? Oh, yeah. I haven't had it in a long time, but I think I was a seventh grader going into my eighth grade year. I went up cocky a little bit, like, yeah, I'm going to beat you, but she destroyed me, absolutely murdered me. So I never challenged her again. I kept it quiet after that. Maybe sooner than rather than later I can do it again when this dies down, but yeah. Who do you think would win this time? Oh, definitely me. Definitely. Definitely. It's not even a question. <laughs> well, if that happens, let me know. I not I don't wouldn't televise it, of course, in the way I do for high school games, but I would be interested in checking that out because I met Dee through basketball and she was a two sport athlete at St. Thomas, if I recall. And uh, yeah, I think that'd be fun. Well, I think the difference now is you have more experience on your side and she's been away from the yeah. game for a little bit. So I think uh, you'll have the conditioning. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be good. And you mentioned some of the challenges you've faced where you said you grew up not having a father figure, but at the same time, you call yourself an optimistic person. So whether it's through life or basketball, what are some mechanisms you've learned, you've adapted to face and overcome challenging situations? Yeah, I mean, growing up, I went through a lot and I didn't have the childhood a lot of people I know had. And I mean, even in high school, my living situation wasn't the greatest. And, but my mom, she taught me to be, she taught me that no matter what, you have to be appreciative of what you have. There's people who don't have the smallest things that you have. And ever since that, I'm appreciative of the roof I have on top of my head, the food I had. And so, I mean, I've learned to be appreciative of the smallest things even. And my mom raised me to be the person I am, and I'm forever thankful for that. But, I mean, also Coach Lauren, Steve, and Dee had a part of that. And I think that, I mean, not growing up with my father, it was really tough on me. But I found another father, Coach Steve. So he was there for me all the time. And I knew if I needed anything, I'd go to them. So, I mean, I mean, it's helped out a lot. And Coach Steve, for those of us who aren't aware, who exactly are you referring to? He's a second father to me. He's the coach of Sugar. He's him and Coach Lori coach Sugar together. They're 
the main people for it and they took me in on one of their own and he's a second father to me he's like the only father I have even though I have a father he's just not here and so I'm very appreciative of him And have you tried to convince him or the Bufords in particular to uh, follow you to LSU in a couple of years to attend your games? Yeah, I mean, they'll definitely be there. I mean, they definitely want to try the Jumbo Lion stuff. But, I mean, when, they definitely want to go to the football games, too. Josh, too, he wants the ticket. I mean, everyone wants to. But, yeah, hopefully we come down here in Minnesota or somewhere in the Midwest and they can come see it or they come down there. But we'll see how it plays out. Not to mention the cuisine. You're going to be oh, yeah. uh, pretty close to New Orleans. I love seafood, but, man, it's going to be something different there. I'm excited for the culture, the learning, the tasting of foods. I mean, it'll be different from what I have here for sure. What do you think people can take and use from your own story to help them get through life no matter what it throws at them? Yeah, I mean... I'm a figure for my community. You don't really see a lot of Somali athletes, especially females, go to college, especially a top college in the nation. So, I mean, I they look up to me, and I think it's amazing that I get to show them you don't have to, you don't have to just be in a stereotype. You can go do what you want. And so, I mean, it's amazing, but, I mean, I'm also, I'm achieving my dream. And, yeah, so I think it's pretty exciting to have a voice in this community, so yeah. As more people, especially when you get to LSU, as they learn about you, how do you think that could inspire others? You know, in this community, we have a high percentage of uh, Somali immigrants, especially Minneapolis, and, you know, word gets around, so what do you think that could do uh, for others, as you said, where you could cover up and play, or even if you're just from that region, you can still go out and be an athlete, live that dream like so many of us have. Yeah, I mean, you look at me and I have the attitude of a happy person. So you wouldn't expect me to have been through all that. I try to say when I step out of those doors, my problems will stay at home. I'll try to keep my problems at home or with the people I trust close to, that I'm close with. And I think that, I mean, I've learned that you got to be appreciative of everything and God has a plan. If you don't, if you don't get what you want, God has a better, bigger plan for you. I mean, you got to be optimistic. And I learned that patience is key. And I mean, it's been a growing experience this past years. So I'm excited and I'm excited for this learning opportunity. I think these last few months have taught us that you don't really know what to expect. Exactly. Is there anything else you'd like to add about your history, your backstory, or just your journey, your growth uh, that would be important for others to know about? Yeah. You don't need a father figure to be successful in life. You can do that on your own with your mother. But take every opportunity you have. Take advantage of it because you don't know if the opportunity will ever come back. Play every game like it's your last, but be positive. Always be positive. Be happy for what you got. Don't say, oh, I didn't get the new iPhone, so I'm not happy about my life. No. Be appreciative of it. Be appreciative of it. Take education very seriously, especially my people from the Somali community, because if athletics isn't your way out, take education as your way out. Support your family. Your parents didn't immigrate here for no reason just for you to fail. So be optimistic, be happy, and be, be appreciative of what God has given you. Thanks again, Tamia. Uh, stay safe out there over these next few days. And I certainly hope I have the chance to cover you again at a high school game. But even if I don't get that opportunity, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, that first game where you put on the LSU jersey. And who knows, maybe you'll end up in that Hall of Famer in the rafters with Sylvia Fowles and Simone Augustus. But it's cool to say that I got to know an LSU athlete <laughs> uh, I've met a lot of folks who go to the mid majors or Lehigh or, you know, they hang around up here in the Midwest. You're going to the SEC. So I hope you're ready for Tennessee and South Carolina. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that'll be exciting. I mean, I watch their games and I say, wow, in two years I'll be playing against these people. So I think it's exciting. 
And Kentucky, I know they're formidable and Tennessee's on the rise. So uh, you're going to a conference that has a strong imprint in women's basketball. And I just think that it's cool. You get to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I dreamt of this. I'm glad and I'm glad for the opportunity I have and I'm glad for the coaching staff for giving me this opportunity. And I'm, I'm grateful to God. So yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate my mom. I appreciate everyone. So it wouldn't be had possible without them. Just make sure uh, that you get your good side or have that ready for the SEC uh, network because uh, you're going to get a lot of TV games <laughs> yeah, when you start yeah. your college career. Definitely. Well, once again, Tamia, thanks for joining us and best of luck, whatever your senior year looks like. And this was an enlightening conversation and I hope we get to do this again sometime. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me on this. Once again, Tamia Ugis of Roseville Area High School. Hopefully she'll get to play one more year with the Raiders, but if not, you can see her suit up in the purple and gold at Louisiana State starting in the 2021-22 season. And if you want to be a guest for a future episode of this series, just hit us up at tsbtelevision at gmail.com or on social media at the Mike Peden on Twitter and Instagram. That does it for this edition of Mike Up Sports. Thanks for watching.